Good afternoon, my name is Erin Quill and I write The Fairy Princess Diaries. Today I am very excited because BroadwayCon has a very special panel for us. Uh, it's, it's BroadwayCon introduces the cast of Soft Power and uh, we are going to be talking to the cast and creators of Soft Power. We are also going to be talking about the rise in violence against Asian American Pacific Islanders. So if you have a trigger that is going to be activated by any topics that come up that have to do with hate speech or hate or actions or violence, please take a moment, uh, gather yourself and prepare yourself, okay? And if you need to take a break, absolutely take that break. All right, so um, first I wanna introduce my panel. My first guest is David Henry Hong. He is a playwright, librettist, screenwriter, and theater professor at Columbia University. He has won three Obie Awards and three of his plays, M Butterfly, Yellowface, and Soft Power have been Pulitzer Prize finalists in the drama category, bam. Uh, M Butterfly was a 1988 Tony Award winner and he was the first Chinese American and the first Asian American to win that coveted award. Soft Power started its journey in May 2018 in Los Angeles and arrived at the Public Theater in New York in 2019. It was nominated for 11 Drama Desk Awards that season. Okay, Francis Jew has been seen off Broadway and on and has a, it is a multiple award nominee and winner for his acting. His awards include Obies, Lucille Lortel Awards, Drama Desk Award nominations, and notable works he has been seen in is Yellow Face, Soft Power, Cambodian Rock Band, The World of Extreme Happiness, Wild Goose Dreams, and he was the original Bun Fu in Bro on Broadway in Thoroughly Modern Millie. And his resume is ridiculous, and honestly, Asian American <laughs> theater would not exist without Francis. So, you know, if you need to look him up, go look him up, because he's all right. The check is uh, in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Conrad Ricamora has appeared on ABC's How to Get Away with Murder, as well as Here Lies Love off Broadway at the Public Theater. He has also been seen as Lunta in the King and I revival of uh, at Lincoln Center, and he was at Soft Power back in the public. And Conrad, do you want to say what show you're working on now? Yeah, uh, I'm working on The Resident. Uh, it's on Fox. Uh, we're shooting our last episode this week. Um, yeah. Very exciting. JG Makapugwai has been my friend for years. Uh, she is in, has been seen on Broadway in School of Rock. She's also been seen in Soft Power and Here Lies Love, both as an ensemble member and as Imelda Marcos. Palaga! She's amazing. And uh, Sunny Heights is the co-choreographer of Soft Power and she has also worked extensively with the Exponential Theater Company. And we are really, really happy to have this representation and this chance to talk about not just Asian American theater, but about um, why representation matters and how the lack of representation that we have been subjected to has played into this narrative of violence against Asian American Pacific Islanders. And it's across the country. I just wanna read a couple of things. A new study by a law enforcement uh, group had Asian hate crimes nationwide rising this past year by 150%, while overall hate crimes fell by 7%. More than 3,700 incidents have been reported to stop Asian hate websites since the pandemic began, with many citing the increase as attributed to negative comments by the former president, as well as a false narrative of being a privileged minority. Uh, along with, the, and, and of that number, women are 2.5 times more likely to be attacked. And that study was from March, 2020 to February, 2021. The Center for Study of Hate and Extremism found an increase of 149% in the last year. Um, with New York City actually being the highest. I thought it would be San Francisco, but it's not. Um, physical violence is a key factor in 11.1% of all anti-Asian hate crimes. And on March 16th, culminating in what is one of the more egregious acts of violence, not only in the United States, but specifically targeting Asian American women, um, six were killed on March 16th uh, overall eight, but six of them were Asian American Pacific Islander were killed when Robert Aaron Long entered three different massage parlors and shot them. So 
in the last month, hate crimes in New York City have jumped 31%. So let's just sit with that for a second, 31% in New York City, which is a city that is 15% Asian American Pacific Islander. So it makes you think. Um, David, I want to talk, I want to start with you because you not only have been subjected to violence, um, you turned it around and made it, which is so amazing, you made it a positive learning experience for the entire theater going public and you displayed this compassion for teaching people why it's wrong across the country. Uh, do you want to talk about how you got started in that? Yeah, so um, I guess I qualify as kind of an uh, OG Asian attack um, in God. that <laughs> in <laughs> several years ago, um, I was just on my block uh, one night around 9 p.m. I was carrying some groceries and um, I felt something hit me hard on the back of my head. Um, and I turned, I saw a shadowy figure running away. Um, then I tried to uh, walk and I couldn't uh, walk straight, but uh, so I put my hand up to where I'd been hit and came away covered with blood. Um, I then learned, realized from, I remember from Boy Scouts, I was a Boy Scout, you can, if you put pressure on a wound, that's a good thing. And when I did, I found I could walk straight. Um, we live about two blocks away from Brooklyn Hospital, and uh, with the help of my wife and daughter, I managed to walk to the ER uh, and then uh, collapsed and um, went into convulsions. Uh, it turned out that my attacker had severed my vertebral artery, and I lost about a third of my blood. Um, so at the time, uh, the NYPD did not classify it as a hate crime. Um, we now know how you know, they don't, don't like to call anything a hate crime. You know, if the Georgia shooter says it wasn't a hate crime, they go, yeah, okay, I guess it wasn't a hate crime. Um, but Assemblyman Ron Kim from Queens uh, called a press conference to denounce anti-Asian um, hate and violence back then. So this is nothing, uh, certainly nothing new. It reoccurs consistently throughout history. And I guess being a writer, um, I ended up needing to work it out in, uh, in, in, in the theater. And so I not only wrote a play, uh, but uh, wrote a musical, uh, Soft Power, that we're talking about with the amazing Janine Tesori and collaborating with this fantastic group of people um, in order to kind of explore what this, what, the roots of this um, hatred and violence and how it fits into the America of today, the America of 2016, the America under the current, under the former president and now going forward as we continue to work on the show uh, under a, a, a much better president, but still with the same crisis of democracy and this anti-Asian hatred spiking around the country. Yeah, it's very disturbing. Um, do you want to talk about it, Francis? Because you got to play DHH, right? So yeah, what no pressure was there. walking around in David's mind? Because not only just David's mind, but David's mind post-attack, post-trying to work out all this, you know, Soros, for lack of a better word. Well, I, I gotta say, it took it it took me a long, long time to really understand, I think, what David was doing. And um and and the more the show got developed, the more explicit I think the script got, but particularly um uh David's character in the show. Um, about how it felt to be attacked and almost die um, because of something as um, central to one's identity as their racial identification. And um, I, I gotta say that uh, it, that process 
and this sort of growing sense of alarm in the character throughout the play um, tracked a lot of my own experience. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco. I was second generation born in the, um, well, actually third generation born in the United States. And uh, so as far as I knew, I was American. Um, as far, and I didn't know any different until other people started pointing out that I wasn't. Um, to them, an American, um, you, you know, and that that you know you could attribute to um, children's you know taunts and just games and and beginning to individuate and notice differences among each other. But it's actually continued throughout um, my life, throughout my career. You know, I can't. I, I've lost count of the number of times that I've been spit on while in college, while um, in Times Square, um, in my own neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen, um, uh, being uh, uh, taunted with racial slurs, being threatened on the subway, um, and, and in not so subtle ways, also being threatened in professional environments at work um, where my English is complimented, or I'm asked, where did you go to school? Um, I mean, all kinds of ways, um, or, or in subtle ways being told that, you know, playing a hero was not in my future. Um, being told that I needed to change my name, you know, all kinds of things um, that made me question uh, my own capacity, my own identity, whether I should be in this business or not, and if I was, what I should allow myself to uh, pursue. And um, it, it's, you know, I'm older and it, it really took me a long time, I think. And with the help of this show to see, you know, what would it be like to be center stage and to take up space, to take up time, to take up people's attention and um, not apologize for that. I think that's one of the key elements for all Asian American Pacific Islanders is that when we are not represented, and I've been saying this for years, when we are not represented on television, on stage, we become adjunct to the main story that is America. And so our pain, our uh, suffering, our just our, but not focusing solely on pain and suffering, like our joy it all gets pushed aside and it gets compartmentalized and people do not have to address it. They don't have to address us, you know, as human. They don't have to address us as worthy of concern because we have not been. We absolutely have not been. And we've been so, you know, it is to the credit, like there's Asian American actors going way, way, way back. And if you talk to, you know, that's one of my favorite things about being an actor is I get to talk to older actors who have been through it and people don't understand how little there was, how everybody was just trying and scrambling. And so I see younger actors kind of coming at the older generation and saying like, well, why did you do this? And why did you, and it's like, they have no conception of how much more open it is now than what it was. Like we stand, you know, just like all the movies say, right? We stand on the shoulders of our ancestors on the people that came before us. And in our cases, it is absolutely true. And it is, they were trying to survive and trying to be artists at a time when they absolutely, the doors were shut. So it is up to us to continue to push forward and insist that our narratives be told. That was one of, I brought my son who was seven to see Soft Power. And when we approached, which you know, cause we saw you at the show. But when we approached the theater, I took a picture of him in front of the marquee and he goes, what is this? And I said, this is the public theater. And he goes, what does that mean? And I said, it's the people's theater. And he said, well, what is, he goes, well, does that mean me too? And I said, yes, today it means you. It means you more today probably than any other day. And he was so joyous. He like two weeks later, he was singing um, the song about the gun. 
you know, he was like, you know, and I was like, what? and I texted Ray and I was like, you know, this is not appropriate for seven. Um, but good guy with like, a gun. Oh, that song is good. Good guy. With Match your song. Good guy. He was like, yes. He was like, ah. So anyway, sorry. So Conrad, let's move to you. You have been you have been featured on a major television show. So and you are again. So you are in on the front lines because you have been in people's living rooms. Yeah. How has that changed how you walk about the street or does it? Well, first of all, I also want to say when we did our bios at the beginning, I forgot to mention that me, Kelvin Moonlow and Jay Madge just, just sold the show. <gasps> and we're, yeah, it's called No Rice, about three gay Asian men living in New York City. Uh, we have our kickoff. I, I don't want to say too much like who, who else is involved because they're probably going to do an announcement it's next week. Next week, we have our kickoff call with the network uh, on Tuesday. So, uh, Mogul, Mogul. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. oh <laughs> and I need shirts and I need, I need so much information. Yeah. I need yes. merch and we need to get merchandise. <laughs> yeah. like, you need merch. I'm ready. That's yeah. so, that's so amazing. Yeah. So okay. I, I, I hope, would like before we go into, uh, you know, what, what, what my experience has been, uh, I, I do want to give that bit of good news to be like, it's, there's light, there's light. Um, Things are slowly <laughs> changing. I mean, they're slowly changing. I, David, could you even imagine writing a show like Soft Power 20 years ago? Um, well, no, and I, I, that's one of the reasons I didn't. But also, you know, Conrad, congratulations. And yeah. it is a moment now when uh, I feel I can go into, uh, you know, studios and producers and pitch stories that don't, uh, about Asians or Asian Americans that don't have a white lead. And it's still hard, but it's, it's possible now. Exactly. Yeah. All right, we're throwing it back to Conrad. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, is, is, because this is Broadway con, I think that, TV and film, it's easier to reach people, Asian Americans in the community that are not already theater like practitioners or like theater goers, which I, because Asian Americans have had such a, uh, a negative, uh, you know, TV and film as well, but really in Broadway they have had uh, negative portrayals of Asian Americans throughout the history of, of Broadway musicals and plays. Uh, and so to get them, to lure them into the theater now, I think uh, for an audience member who's just, who who is not in the theater world uh, is tougher because they probably don't feel like they have a place there. Um, as somebody who has is a an actor, um, I, I remember I said this at the beginning of, uh, previews when Janine circled us up she's she wanted to know what this show costs all of us and for Asian American actors you know the the whole the goal as an actor is to be able to stand in front of an audience fully present but when you grow up and all you see is your race minimized or used as a specific gag, uh, then that's what you think is possible for you. And so then you get into uh, a world where you're trying to do this as a living and you hone in on those things and not the breadth of your humanity as you are. And for any, uh, any Asian American actor that has gotten to the point where they're doing this for a living you I applaud them and I know that they have had to overcome so much more than some other uh, populations because we have not had a celebrated culture uh, we our, our culture has been denigrated at least I mean that's been my experience of growing up and so how do you then step into 
a spotlight in front of hundreds or thousands of people with your whole, whole uh, humanity. And I think now that's being, we're given that opportunity because of people like David, because he's writing us as human beings uh, and has been doing that for a long time, uh, that when we are now asked to do it, Asian actors are like, oh, okay. <laughs> you wanna see all of me now? Right. Okay. Um, you don't want you don't want my tricks from like uh, that I did to work in Miss Saigon or uh, anything goes or uh, in, I mean even the King and I to some extent like the yeah. all of those things like so uh, I think it's it it's definitely getting better but I just want to say to all of my fellow Asian American actors like I know I totally get and I applaud how far you have come wherever you are in your process with it. Yeah, I think, you know, talking about Saigon and talking about, you know, JG, you're obviously, you're female. Um, <laughs> JG and Sunny, how have you, now, now hate crimes against Asian American women are two and a half times more likely to occur, right, than, than men. Um, I think one of the nice things about shows like Warrior being on uh, HBO Max or, you know, where more people can see it is like, now I do think that people are taking like half a second to be like, hmm, should I attack that man? But, you know, how have you been responding during the pandemic to street harassment and that kind of thing? Um, well, when I found out about the Atlanta um, murders, I, reached out to the organization that I'm active with, Broadway Barcada, which is a, a Filipino organization of artists. And um, I am currently coordinating a self-defense workshop for our members. And there's um, over a hundred of us and it's going to be just for us. And there are going to be two, uh, um, two uh, self-defense instructors, one of them Filipino, and it's gonna be rooted in Kali martial artists, and which is a Filipino form of martial arts. And it's just gonna give us a little bit more knowledge and empowerment because honestly, and you know, you talked about 31% of Asian American violence. A lot of my friends are afraid to take the subway right now. A lot of my Asian American family are concerned about, you know, stepping out. I'm one of them. And so to be able to have just a little something of security, just little tools. Um, I got excited because, you know, in the mail, I, I ordered a palm stick, which is something that you attach to your keychain. That's uh -huh. kind of like a shake. But I was like so excited and I've been giving it away to my female friends, Asian American friends, and they're like excited. We're excited about getting this, but at the same time, how horrible is it that we're in this state of feeling like we, we have to do some something for ourselves in order to feel safer? And do you think that like shows, for example, like Miss Saigon, like The King and I, for certain, for certain rules, not all the rules, but um, do you think that that has added to the perception of submissive, overtly sexual, you know, stereotypes that we face? Or do you think that, like, I have two takes on Saigon. One, I definitely see the bar scene and I'm like, okay, not my favorite, <laughs> like not my favorite. But, um, you know, as Leia and I have talked about, it's only 10 minutes of the show. Um, the rest of the show is about a mother's love for her child and what she will do to maintain that child's innocence, to maintain that child's life, you know, she will kill for him. And so I have like a, I have a hard time with, with saying, you know, throw all of it away because isn't it a great love story, not between her and Chris, but between her and Tam, you know? But what is the, what is, and, and of course the engineer is like the perfect archetype villain. He's just like amazing. Um, what do you think? Have you done Saigon? Four times. Four times. Okay. Were you Kim or were you Gigi or? It started as Kim and then as I went down to the, as I got older, 
I became more weathered and the, the, the weathered hoe as I further <laughs> went down. And did you find that audiences appreciated your performance or did they still categorize it as like you were a stereotype and that, it, you know, as much humanity and as much thought and devotion as I know you bring to all your things, did you still think that there was a part of you that that wasn't being respected in the way, for example, like, um, let's see, what's a good show? Uh, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Like people come out of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and they're not talking about the whores. They're talking about like, that was a great song. Those were great dance numbers. That Do you think that it's different when you come out of Saigon as a cast member? Well, you know, having done the show several times, I think it's also a, a combination of what the creative team, what the people in the room and how much research and respect they have for the, for the story and for the cast. And I have been very fortunate in the productions that I've been in where the, that respect was given and wanting to get feedback. If I feel like the creative team is talking at us, then I do feel like a commodity, but right. Thankfully, and, and when I had talked to audience members and cast members when the, in the show, we feel a certain responsibility to tell the story well and to acknowledge that if I am a bar girl, that actually happened in history. And so we wanted to be able to, dis, to be able to show their plight and their struggles, like when we sang Movie In My Mind. And honestly, if it weren't for Miss Saigon, I don't think I would have been in the business because in the shows that I'd seen growing up, and in media, I didn't see myself there. So it wasn't even something that like, I didn't, you, you, I felt like I had a right to be on that stage. I just didn't know that, that I had permission or I could be on that stage. So seeing Miss Saigon gave me that, that um, permission to do it. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I have no regrets about my history of how I started performing and like the first, four shows that I did were Miss Saigon. And then, um, and the thing is, as, a, as an activist, I don't think of myself as one, but I do feel like when I am hired to do a show that my presence on stage is a form of activism. So yes. um, I am so thankful that over the course of my career, that the material has changed and that if I felt all I could do were Miss Saigon's, that's where I get sad if all I could do were the king and I's but thanks to David Henry Huang and and being a part of this show talk about merging activism with what I love to do and as Conrad was saying we have to find our own way and being able to um, show ourselves and allow ourselves to be seen in this business and and I'm still finding my own way I'm not ever the loudest voice in the room but I also know that I'm gonna to continue to show up. I'm gonna to continue to be present and give my one, and it takes bravery to be on stage and to give 100% of yourself on that stage. And so that's the way I do it. And I'm still finding other ways that I can be an activist, but um, it helps when you're within a room of people that make you feel so secure and safe. Um, a lot of the shows that I've done in my career have been Asian shows and amazing that that's actually what I can say I, I, on my portfolio shows. It's where I feel safest and it's where I feel most seen and I'm thankful for all of that. JG, you're not just a leader on stage, you're a leader backstage as well. You're, mm -hmm. you're such an incredible um, activist leader um, and you empower everyone that you work with. It's, it's really, um, I'm, I'm so grateful to have worked with you. You set a tone of respect and uh, equanimity and, um, and just, yeah, that's what, that's what you do, JG. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think every time you take the stage as an Asian American Pacific Islander, it's a political act. And I don't think that your presence has to be justified by doing political outreach or being a 
spokesperson. However, that seems to be a byproduct because that's where we are in our society. You know, I hope that as we move forward, we won't have to do quite so much like, hey, look at us, we're people too. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and also the conversation about Saigon and just like the archetypes and the stereotypes, it's because we have a dearth of material. We only have like five or six shows, right? So mm -hmm. when you only have five or six examples, you don't have a broad sampling of all the different ways people are and all the different humanitarian discussions that can be had or whatever. That's, you know, that's why I like soft power because I was like, I got it. it was so smart. It was so smart. And Sunny, how great was the choreography on that show? I want to talk to you because you are one of the few uh, female choreographers and you are working now, you know, on this level with with you know, an all, almost all Asian American Pacific Islander cast, what does that, how does that fuel you as, as you go along? Uh, it's everything. <laughs> it, it's uh, th this um, show gives me um, life, <laughs> to put it simply. Um, and I, I want to backtrack one second just on like the numbers that you were mentioning earlier, because I think it's important in terms of the statistics that we're talking about to, to say that those are the reported um, right. crimes, right? Like, you know, they're like, these things can exist on a spectrum of like microaggressions to like what happened in Atlanta. Um, and so I, I just think that's like an important specific to, to point out when we're like discussing all, all of this. But um, yeah, this was, this was actually my first time um, working, working on an Asian show. Like I, it was a, it was a privilege. It is a privilege. Um, and I, I don't, I don't take it for granted like one second um and and i have to say that i didn't always imagine myself in in this position because i similar to what other folks have said i didn't see myself in you know i didn't imagine that i could um choreograph a show at the public i've worked with the public on other productions but like in that position um, it was it was hard for me to imagine it, and it wasn't until um, Sam, who I've known from other other work together, um, asked me to just come in and workshop the very beginnings of of what would then become, you know, what was on stage. I worked with Sam. I worked with Sam on Dave that same summer, and yeah. he and, and on a break. He leaned over and he goes, hey. I said, yeah. He goes, have you ever heard of this show called Soft Power? And I was like, Sam Nicholson, if, if I did not get Dave, I would be having a friggin' nervous breakdown that I was not in Soft Power this summer. So thank you for opening a wound. He's like, well, do you, and then he went through the entire company and he's like, do you know this person? I'm like, yes, yes, stop bugging me. We're, we're Asian, we're, there's like 25 of us and we all just know each other, like, ah. So, I, you know, but I mean, Dave was great, but it, it was, but like, sometimes you really want to be with your people, especially when it's a remarkable moment, like this show was, do you know what I'm saying? Like when I was able to bring my son and see it, I was so moved by all of your performances, but then I was like, God, I, I want to play. Because Asians are the best. We are the best. The best. We food and we like and we have relatives that have restaurants and like they cater and it's amazing you know i always never... say if you have more if you have more asians in your show it, it will be easier because they are so supportive they come to everything because That's they have my experience too team. i'll never forget the moment in rehearsal speaking of sunny um where as much as the show riffs on um, themes and aesthetics in The King and I, various productions of The King and I throughout history. Um, there were, you know, um, there were, there was movement that was being workshopped. And Sonny 
stopped rehearsal at one point and asked us what it felt like to be doing that movement and what it meant, what we thought it meant to be doing that movement, which echoed uh, elements of The King and I. And it sparked this incredible conversation. And it struck me that there are, there are a hand, only a handful of times where I think we were allowed, um, where I have been allowed to, to collaborate in that way, to help author the intent of the movement in the show. And um, through that process, I think the creative team and the company um, uh, grew to understand what, what um, the effect of the movement was and, and how it needed to evolve. And it was just, it was just one of the most incredible um, human, generous, compassionate moments I've ever had in a rehearsal room. And I give Sunny all the credit for that. I think this is a remarkable show on so many levels because it is a modern show. It is not based, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It is even, you know, it, in this in the late 70s, it is based kind of current events slash the future. Um, we know that the world is changing demographically. We know the world is changing. We know the influence on the United States of foreign nations is changing. Our relationships always kind of evolve that way. So what is the thing that you are taking away from soft power as, a, as an actor? As a, just like, like the, not just the joy, but like, what does it mean to you? Because I want the people watching this panel to understand that when you have not been seen for so long and all of a sudden it's like somebody threw back the curtain and they show you in your entirety, what does that feel like? Comrade, you want to go? Yeah, I feel like it's, in, I'm still amazed how David is turning something that is so personal and painful into something that empowers so many people. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be stumbling down that street with your blood, like, like pouring out of you and then to get to this point to where you have turned it into something that is making a statement and also a, a, a vehicle for so many of us to get into get in this vehicle and and feel empowered through something that was so life-threatening um i think is one of the most remarkable creative endeavors that I have ever not only seen, but been a part of. JG, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, the prophecy of, of what happened to David and to what's happening today, um, it's like this empowerment that Conrad references is how I feel. By the end of the show of Soft Power, I feel so seen. And, and then that's also a reflection of what the process was like in creating Soft Power that, I've been mentioned that like, I mentioned how safe I feel in this environment, but as theater starts to come back, um, we are not exactly sure what it's gonna look like and where these roads are gonna lead us to. And I imagine that we're gonna be in situations where we aren't as safe um, in a creative process, where we're maybe the only Asian voice in the room or one of the few people of color in the room, that we remember the agency that we felt during the process that'll hopefully give us that much courage so that we can, mention when something feels off or is going in the wrong direction or where we're not being represented in a fair way that like because of shows like soft power that gave us power and strength that we'll be able to be equipped better and know that we're supported if not here in in this potential situation where we're not safe but we've got our people that we can talk to to help amp us up to give us bravery moving forward great sunny do you want to as, as a creator, how do you want to continue forward with what you learned in Soft Power? Um, soft Power, the experience of Soft Power um, has almost ruined me for any other experience because I have an incredibly high bar for who I want to work with and how I want to work. Um, 
I have said no to a lot of other things since soft power because it doesn't meet that bar. And I feel like as we start to go back to work, as things start to open up, um, we know that we can't go back to the way things were before. There, there are so many truths that have been uncovered um, in, in our industry. Um, and I do believe that soft power, um, you know, as we continue to rework it and fingers crossed, hopefully it has another life. Um, I, I know that we will continue those high standards and that it can be, I believe it can be an example actually for our industry, for how we want things to change and how we, um, Soft Power is a show that we, we see the world, it creates a world as, as how we wanna be seen, right? So um, I think that goes down to every part of how the show is made and how it works and the organism that it is and the family that it is. Um, so I believe that we can be an example. Okay, I wanna shoot to Francis and then I'm gonna let David wrap it up because he is the beginning and the end uh, in terms of this show and its creation. So Francis, what would you like going forward? Well, in the, in the moment that we're in, where it's estimated that more than 30 incidents of anti-Asian hate are happening every single day in every state of this place that we call home. And at the very same time that that is being highlighted, we're also being told by um, people that we have considered allies, that we have our, allied ourselves with, that it's not really as bad as our pain. It's not as, it, 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 this is not the time for you to have the mic. Um, and you need to wait your turn. You need to sit in the back, back of the bus. Um, it's really easy, I think, in this moment to become really bitter and, or to feel ashamed and to apologize for our, for our own pain, um, to be embarrassed, um, to um, want our um, oppression to be uh, acknowledged. And the show, I think, gives me reason to be hopeful, to get, to still have the anger and the pain and the frustration, but also to have hope, um, to believe that um, inclusion still is possible, um, to believe that, it, there, it, that, that the human family can evolve. And um, that I think has been uh, the greatest gift that I've received from the show. That's very moving. David, I'm gonna end with you. Uh, this began, this show, this whole journey um, began with an anti-Asian hate crime. And what has evolved is an Asian American love story to representation, to performers, to people who see the problem and want to address the problem and do it with humor, with compassion, with humanity. Uh, what are you taking from, because I know, I know you're, you're not maybe done with soft power. So what, what is, uh, what's next? Yeah, well, first of all, it's important to, for me to acknowledge this group and the whole cast and company and creative team that worked on the show because, you know, it means so much. When we say somebody originated a part, that has great significance because these guys know, um, I, I and the whole creative team, we do so much work um, in rehearsal, rewriting, changing things, and they influence uh, the outcome of the show. Um, and then, you know, Conrad and, and uh, uh, several of you were talking about, you know, taking something painful and horrible and making it something positive. Um, and I think I didn't know what we were completely doing when I went into this. So working on the show, writing it, and making it with these folks enabled me to 
find something to move forward. And you have to acknowledge the hate. You have to acknowledge the pain. You have to acknowledge the shame before you can begin to build a better future. And I think that's what our show's trying to do. And yes, we are currently reconceiving it. We're currently rewriting. We have wonderful supportive producers. We intend to come back to New York in a post 2020 version that focuses on US China relations uh, and our place as AAPIs during the ongoing crisis of democracy in this country. Um, and fingers crossed, Broadway, but we, we will be back. That is amazing because what I could wish more for Broadway is actually top of my list would be that everybody would get to see a show like Soft Power in a Broadway theater with all that excitement and all that love behind it from people who are committed to doing those eight shows a week, showing up and showing all the different ways that we represent and that we identify. I think it's really important to have shows that are new and exciting and speak to the Asian American Pacific Islander ex experience as it is now, not just as it is you know, throughout musical theater history, but this show is making musical theater history and it's progressive and it's interesting and it's funny as hell. I mean, it is not a snooze fest at all. Like people are redonkulous in this show. There's so much. <laughs> There's jokes upon jokes upon jokes. I mean, look, if my seven-year-old could get, I turned to him and he was hysterical laughing. So if he can, if he can get the jokes and then on, the, on a different level, I can get the jokes as well. That's, I mean, to me, that's, that's a classic American musical. So I want to congratulate all my panelists. I want to congratulate all my guests. I want to say Broadway Con, you really need to appreciate this interview for what it is, which is the rebirth of the Asian American Pacific Islander experience in theater. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it.